Hey, how's it going, guys? I've got Kingmaker here from a project called BetSwap, which is probably going to be a project people talk about with the GambleFi narrative that's coming up with crypto. I'm going to ask them some questions and kind of go from there. So first off, thanks, Kingmaker, for, uh, for jumping on to do the interview. Yeah, <laughs> nice to be here, uh, Kyle. Um, we've, we noticed you a while back, right? And uh, we saw your videos. I remember we did some collaborations and everything. So it's definitely good to see you back, um, especially since we just launched the version 2 beta, right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I'm going to, I'm definitely got some questions to ask about that version two. And yeah, I do remember, uh, I was with that time wonderland project. So I got the, I got some of these BSGG tokens as part of that. And I remember doing some videos back like last year. So it's cool to see that you guys are still building and, uh, and all that. And, uh, happy to do some updates on this one. So who exactly, what is, what do you do at BetSwap? So currently I'm head of Web3. So basically everything that has to do with the blockchain, with the tokens, um, and specifically like the swapping part on the uh, platform, the non-custodial um, design is something that um, I'm spending a lot of time on. Like, and, and I'm often the decision maker in, in how we're supposed to architect these, uh, these kind of things. And on the side, I'm also caretaking the role of community manager. That's basically how I started and been uh, in this project since Wonderland as well, since Wonderland made the investment. And I really saw the potential of having um, gambling become decentralized, right? Because that's also our ultimate goal is to keep this aspect of decentralization and, and remove the need for third parties, um, remove the need to hold custody of people's funds. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's, that's, that's my vision and that's also the company's vision. So it makes me super excited uh, to talk about it as well. Okay. Yeah. And we're, we are going to get to, I was going to ask that, so you might've beat me to it. <laughs> what makes it, what makes BetSwap important? Why go to the blockchain? But I want to start with, so what is, what is essentially the origin story? Like how did you guys or you or whoever, who put this together and, and, uh, got it started? So we have uh, two founders, uh, Mavix and uh, Gigi Max. Um, I don't have their full story, obviously. That's something they will come on and, and talk about themselves uh, whenever on an AMA or whenever someone asks them that question. But I came into BetSwap, obviously, after hearing it from Wonderland. And I just tried to give my input, like being a true Fijian as well, <laughs> you know. Um, and obviously, I also have a background in mathematics and economics, uh, more specifically quantitative finance. So I've been able to use sort of uh, both the, um, the experience I had sitting in, um, in DeFi and trading myself and also the theoretical background when it comes to trading. And yeah, so, so it's, it's basically been a slow process. Uh, but, but yeah, um, we came up with the idea of building this version two after the first version came out. And we realized that, first of all, even though Polygon is a cheap chain, it's not always that the transactions go super fast, right? Like even the fact that you have to post a transaction at the be at the very best can take like six, eight seconds, right? Uh, usually yeah. it takes a bit longer before it's completed. And then you'll have to have someone who's willing to match that bet who also has to match it on the blockchain. And then sometimes the blockchain even gets stuck, right? So you have a transaction going and it's not going anywhere. And imagine you just put five grand on some bet and, and you're sitting there waiting for the transaction. And then suddenly after, I don't know, five minutes, the transaction goes through, but now the odds have changed. So you're much worse off and someone matches it immediately because for them it's like, uh, it's great odds. So yeah, uh, I really think and believe that we're moving in the right direction and super proud again to present it. But again, you said you had some questions regarding it. So uh, so I'll wait a bit with that part. Uh, yeah. So is this is it like in a non led team mostly like is there any real faces behind it or is it like pseudonym pseudonymous type of thing? Um, well, it's not like super anon and obviously um, a lot of the private investors know who we are and who the people behind the company are, but it's more as a security measure, as you know, with crypto projects in general, um, the token price can affect people, 
people's lives a lot, even if they hadn't hadn't done anything wrong. And we're talking about like death threats and just in general, people on the internet can be very scary. So yeah. I actually support most of the team who prefer to stay anon and not have their face out there. But we do have some people in the company who don't really mind. We've had that in the past. Uh, our previous uh, product director would always come on the AMAs and he had his face out there as well. So, I mean, it's more um, a personal choice, a personal preference. And we are, we're okay with people not wanting to um, remove this anonymity. But obviously, if anything goes wrong, then we have all the means to hold people accountable for it. So it's not like we have 20 employees sitting around the world without having no idea who they are, just the OX something. <laughs> We right. we and uh, we know who the people working for the company are, and um, yeah, I, I think I think it's the best way to go. Gotcha. I was kind of I was kind of leading into you know the SEC Ripple stuff, and there's a lot of regulations, um, you know, kind of gray area, I guess you could say. And with gambling specifically, it's one of those niches or niches, whatever, where if you're taking away market share from like Las Vegas. You know what I mean? There's going to be, there's a lot of tax revenue that's from gambling and whatnot. And I was wondering if you guys were a non, because are you guys trying, I want to, I want to phrase this correctly. Do you guys have any reason to fear regulations? Is compliance something that you guys plan to do? Or is it kind of one of these shades of gray right now? Like, where does where do you guys kind of sit in terms of regulation and compliance? Uh, I'm actually very happy that you asked that question because compliance is something that we take very seriously. Um, first of all, we do have the Curacao license that allows us to have the site open in a bunch of countries. And we're also actively geo-blocking certain locations. So yeah, the the locations where, yeah, where we do not have uh, the permission, we obviously do not operate. So... It's something we're monitoring as well and something that we're really conscious about and also something that we have uh, legal opinions on. For example, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we even got a legal opinion on our new token, like the DBSDG token, um, because obviously it is pegged to USDT, which is pegged to the dollar. Um, yeah. And that could also be an issue, but so far um, we've... Uh, We've not encountered any any problem with it, but obviously, if we receive some reprimand or someone saying that uh, something is in the gray zone, then we'll take that seriously and make sure that we're on the right side. Because the last thing we want is for us to get um, or go against the government, right? Um, right. We want to okay. live up to all the regulations that are out, out there. So I think we've done a pretty good job so far um, with the licenses and everything. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I noticed at the bottom of the website when I was doing the review video just a couple of days ago, it was like bet swap, like NV. So I'm assuming like Nevada, which is where Las Vegas is actually at, is where it's incorporated, although it is operated. Uh, in... No, NV stands for something different. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, so we have the Curacao license, right? So the yeah. company is based in Curacao. Okay. Okay. Ah, just total coincidence. Okay. Uh, well, that's no. Yeah, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you guys are trying to do that because I, I guess you know the 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 term decentralized is floated around a lot in crypto, obviously, as you're aware, right? And yeah. although parts of the network seem decentralized, for example, when you place the bets and whatnot, it's smart contracts that close things. And as far as as far as like that part, right? But mm -hmm. is this really something? gambling in general gamblify speaking more broadly that can really be decentralized if you are aiming to remain compliant and and up to date with regulations um i don't see how one thing um prohibits the other i mean when we talk about sports betting for me decentralization is just that you have a platform that is up and running right and the bets you're placing and the feeds you're getting are not controlled by a single entity. So obviously gotcha. right now where we are, it's impossible to be 100% decentralized. Also when it comes to sports betting, you do have some solutions that, uh, or some um, entities that are working on solutions for that. For example, having oracles decide what the feed should be or what the odds should be. And then you have a lot of different odds and then um, the oracle feeds it from there um, in a decentralized manner. But obviously it's uh, we've seen how 
DAOs have fallen apart, like running a completely decentralized system is, is, is almost impossible. But yeah. I think we have to focus more on the the things that the blockchain brings and especially for us and that's mostly with the trustless permissionless and non-custodial part especially the non-custodial because today if you for example have ten thousand dollars deposited into a betting account somewhere if something goes wrong then that 10k might not be yours anymore i mean if the company goes bankrupt you'll never have your 10k back right but the way that our non-custodial side works is that when you deposit it into it into the smart contract it's in there and we don't have access to those funds. So whenever you want to cash out, you'll always be able to. And I think that's one of the most important things uh, when it comes to uh, gambling. Okay. And I, I think I do remember hearing also one of the big benefits of using something like BetSwap is in, instead of you know the other betting exchanges and casinos is that if you win, because I, I don't gamble personally, but... I'm told that if you go and gamble and then you win sometimes, and this is what you were alluding to, I think with like controlling funds is sometimes they will make it, they'll add some friction for you to actually get paid out. Is that another? For, benefit? Yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. Um, winners get tracked a lot because obviously uh, most gambling entities are measuring profit. And if they see there's one profitable player, then through the KYC, they'll just make sure that this player can't play again. Or if they can, then their maximum bet will be like $10 or something. So they're really limiting. And people are also getting angry about that. Like people love the story about the guy who went in and beat the house and all of that stuff, right? Um, and I definitely agree with that aspect. Um, I think that if you're good at something, then it's, uh, I mean, then the company should maybe lower the odds for everyone. So yeah. people that are not good at it, are going to lose less in the long run, right? And then yeah. they can limit what the winners are getting. But if they're living off of people just losing money and losing money and losing money, then they should also be uh, ready to pay out to those who actually know how to play, right? I agree. Um, I agree with that. fairness, right? Kind of thing. Yeah. Kind of deal. Totally. Yeah, you know, you see the movies where the mobsters in Vegas used to, you know, do not so good things to people that win. Exactly. So I guess moving to, uh, you know, you guys do have version two that is either launched. Is it officially live or is that at the end of the month that it's live? I mean, the beta is live right now. Um, we knew that we would not be able to catch every single little glitch or bug that would be on the platform. So we mm -hmm. decided to initially launch it with a beta and then hopefully have our wonderful community report back to us uh, if they found something and... Uh, and yeah, but um, most of the features are out already. And I mean, we've received, we've received such positive feedback on the UI, the UX, like the whole platform, the fact that we added Casino, the fact that we even have our own BetSwap original games, which are, is like Crash, Dice, um, those type of games. So, so yeah, um, the product that you see now is going to be almost what the, the finished product, product is going to look like. Okay. And so is that the is that the biggest difference with so the difference between version one and version two is adding the casino and then uh, just a change in the UI UX the user interface? No, 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 no. I mean, the one of the hugest uh, differences is the fact that we added our own stablecoin. And I'll give a huge, um, not a huge, a quick explanation on why we decided to do that because I've even had other people who are experienced in DeFi ask me why not just use whatever stable kind like USDT. So the problem is that the way it works right now is that funds are deposited into the smart contract, right? So mm -hmm. let's imagine you deposited 5,000 USDT and you just placed a bet with the same 5,000 on a football match that will take place in a week from now. So let's say you put in the bet on Monday and now it's Wednesday and suddenly USDT depicts. Uh, what, what are you going to do in this situation? Because you are not able to do anything with your bet until Saturday because it, you already placed the bet, right? So you'll have to wait. But the USDT depicts and once, I mean, maybe it will even crash by the time you'll get your money out. But now we have the free liquidity pools placed on Kyber, which means that Whenever people buy DB, DBHG, one DBHG, they leave one USDT behind. And we have access to these pools. So in an event where this would happen, we would be able to manage and de-risk and 
put in another stable coin, for example, and exchange it. So, gotcha. uh, so you're more safe. And yeah, right now we only have USDT, but obviously we're looking to diversify what stable coins we do have in the Kyber pools. So the risk is smaller, but again, we just launched. So, it, but it, again, it's, it's something we're looking into, obviously, and monitoring. Okay. Um, and the second big thing is that what I just spoke about is the non-custodial side, right? Is where you deposit it into the smart contract. But what we also realized is that the world just isn't ready yet for everything blockchain and, and finding out what, what is MetaMask and, and connecting to the site and everything. So we decided to also have our site be Web 2.0 at the same time. So you actually have the choice as a user. Do you want to go in the traditional way like you're used to with an email signing up and, and then using your credit card to get some funds on the site? Or do you want to go the Web 3.0? way um and what we're also hoping to do at the same time is that once we both have people from web 2 and web 3 is that we will be able to convert some of these web 2 players and educate them on like look you can now play non-custodial so in any event your funds are always safe and you always have the keys to your funds so yeah. uh so yeah the I might have missed something because we had, I mean, obviously a lot of changes um, and we also have a lot of changes planned for the future um so yeah, but if I'll if I'll remember some of the other stuff, I'll definitely let you know. Okay, and yeah, the, the web too. So the people that load fiat and the people that load crypto USDT, they can still bet against each other, right? Or is there some sort yeah. of rule? Yeah. Okay, cool. No, no, no. Okay. They're they're still on the same platform. Yes. And then right now, you guys have we you mentioned Polygon, and then I think what are the other what other network? Binance Smart Chain and Ethereum. Ethereum. Okay, cool. So you can play Binance and Polygon, which is cheaper. And so you can get around like the expensive ETH gas, right? By just using those two networks instead. Exactly. And I mean, yeah. the reason we even have ETH is just because it's the OG and you might have some people that know about ETH and they don't really care about gas fees. They just want to play. They don't care about winning or something. They're just like, okay, sure. I'll, I'll just go in. So it's just to have it there. Um, yeah. Okay. Awesome. So to get into a little bit of the uh, the technicals now, if you don't mind, like just some questions yep. that I had when I was doing the review. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. All right. So can you can you can see this? Yep. So when I was looking at the uh, the tokens, just trying to figure out the distribution on this, I assume time zero here is about like January 2022. I believe yeah, that could very well be. Okay. And then, so it's been 19 months or so since the launch. And if I just bring that out to about here, it looks like there should be about five, you know, cause there's a max supply of 10 billion. It looks like yep. the circulating supply should be around like, you know, about half, like 5 billion. Yep. But yep. I was looking at, uh, well on coin gecko, it's not updated. Uh, but I did, I, I can't remember if it was you or Henry that said that they did put in a request to get this updated. It also isn't even ranked like of the gambling coins because it's not on here. But I noticed when I went to the token, if you go to the holders, these two here, these two wallets, which yeah. in the Discord at least they confirmed are your guys's. I don't know which one's which, yeah. but this makes up 70, roughly 70% 70 of the tokens, which would mean that... Yes that 30%, which would be like 3 billion, would be the circulating. Am I right in thinking in, in, in that so far? Um, not, not entirely. Um, some of these tokens, uh, I don't remember which contract is which, but one of them is the vesting contract. So basically when we had the private investors coming in initially, they mm -hmm. got vested some tokens and... I mean, there's not a lot of them that, that even have claimed. I mean, obviously their business schedule have begun, but they're not looking to sell anytime soon because they're here for the long run, right? Okay. So the number you see is just the tokens that are ready to get released in a span of three years. Gotcha. So until they claim them, they'll still be in that contract. And then okay. the other one is for everything else you see on the tokenomics. Like it, okay. it could be whatever. It's, it's just sitting there waiting to get used in one way or another. Okay, that makes more sense. That makes sense. So it's just sitting there, but it could be circulating if they chose to claim it and sell it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, perfect. I appreciate the clarif clarification on that one. 
Uh, so someone, cause someone did mention in the discord that the team is doing buybacks. Uh, but I know that the buyback and burn feature isn't turned on yet. Is there any truth to the team doing buybacks? I'd imagine they would have to raise funds to do buybacks. So is there any truth to that or, or what's going on there? I mean, yes and no. Um, a guy from Wonderland actually said something very funny because Wonderland is doing buybacks as well, right? And uh, he has this famous phrase that says, we do not speak about buybacks, you know, uh, from the classic okay. uh, Fight Club movie. Um, I mean, the reason for that mostly is because you don't want people to know exactly what your purpose is because then they can come in and sort of try to take advantage of that. Like, for example, if I was telling you, yeah, every Monday we are buying, um, I don't know, 50 million tokens, then this person would come in like every Sunday oh, evening and then he would yeah. buy the tokens, right? And then he would sell them on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, but what I what I can say um, is that we have um, gotten a lot of tokens back. Um, I think we're sitting at close to 600 million tokens now. Um, and that has been mostly due to Wonderland... Um, farming uh, or like the wonderland farm where they distributed a lot of bhg um mm -hmm. and yeah um so these buybacks are not um necessarily tied to the buyback and burn but the thing is that in the future when we do get some profits then the burn just needs to correspond to the revenue amount right and right. then we'll have tokens that we're ready to burn if we need to um, because it doesn't really matter where the tokens come from, right? The most important yeah. uh, part is just that tokens get burned. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, um, okay. that that explains it. I mean, the uh, while we're here on on Coin Gecko, let me bring this back in. I did have a question. I'm going to show this chart, and it's ugly, but this is what people look at, right? So I just wanted to kind of. Yeah. Have a combo about it. So this is this was on launch roughly. I don't know if CoinGecko caught it the day of the launch, but we had this price action here, and I, I know uh, 2022 we just had a bear, right? I mean, in January. Well, I can I can get I can give you the exact explanation of what even happened on that day um, because yeah. I was sitting there as well. <laughs> and so what happened was that. Wonderland got their share of tokens on the same day. And I believe the agreement was that Wonderland would provide liquidity for it. And mm -hmm. that was also right before the Wonderland crash. So people were still in, in bull mode. So once Sifu posted liquidity or once he got the tokens and yeah, posted liquidity, before they even announced anything, people were already buying it. People were already buying BHDG tokens. So essentially that pushed the price up to 18 cents on, mm -hmm. on uh, the token launch date. Here. And then, yeah, and then uh, what Sifu did, which, I mean, I don't disagree with what he did, looking from a Wonderland uh, point of view, he removed some of the liquidity at the top to reduce their cost basis. And that obviously sent the signal. I mean, I saw buys for like, uh, I was actually messaging a guy back then before I was even involved with BetSwap, and he la lost like, I don't know, 500,000 or something that they on, on the trade once uh, some of the liquidity got uh, removed. But I believe it was a third of it. Uh, so it wasn't like a rock pool. It was just removing the top because obviously um, if they could reduce their cost bases, then it was, I mean, um, they were allowed to do that because it would have been different if we were providing the liquidity, right? And then we suddenly just uh, removed some of the liquidity. And obviously yeah. we would have had to, to keep it there. And um, yeah, so that's where the price went down to five cents, I believe. And yep. then... It was sitting around that level for quite some time. Uh, this was UST then, about right here. May 9th, this was UST Luna. Maybe. I mean, this was around that time when Luna collapsed. I don't think that had anything to do with maybe just a normal downtrend. And then what is uh, this? I think because BSG was paired with ETH at that point, uh -huh. the, the price drop in ETH would obviously also make the price of BSG drop. Right? Okay. Um, during that period and then that that part was the wonderland redemption where they um decided to release 200 million tokens in an instant dang and, uh, 
um, okay. yeah, I've heard plenty of rumors of why they decided to do that, but obviously uh, I'm not gonna go into that because if yeah. you have no proof, then there's no reason. But yeah, but it had nothing to do with with that swap. Um, it was just the Wonderland collapsing in general, and um, yeah, it is what it is. I mean, if the token at that uh, at that point um, had more liquidity, then obviously it would be harder to make the price drop. But 200 million tokens were a lot to get released in an instant, and that scares a lot of people, which also decreases the buy pressure. And then right after that, Wonderland started um, the farm. Or maybe maybe the price drop from April to July was the fact that Wonderland already started the BGG farm. I don't exactly yeah. remember. It could be. It might have been. It could be, it it, could be a mix of getting, uh, e-falling. Yeah. yeah. They're probably getting the tokens and then just selling them because they didn't really care because they were just getting them yeah. for free, essentially. Yeah. And then, yeah. obviously, after that, um, they kept uh, distributing BSGG, which, again, decreased the buy pressure because nobody wants to buy a token that they know is going to be um, done in the coming months. Yeah. And, and yeah, but, but since then, um, the token has been on a slow increase and uh, Wonderland stopped their distribution. So I think it's given people some confidence on the token. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So then I guess two, I got two more questions here. I know that we have uh, this multi-chain issue, right? Where the CEO and like his sister are being detained and they were the only ones that had access to the bridge funds of which a lot of it uh, was some of these BSGG tokens. If you look on Avalanche, it's like one point, you know, almost 1.8 billion of the BSGG tokens on Avalanche. So the yep. native token BSGG is kind of stuck here. And I know this isn't just a you guys problem. This is probably a lot of projects. Is there any plan, at least if you can't share, that's fine. But is there any plan yet or any ideas as to how to overcome this problem? Oh, it's definitely something that I'm, I'm more than willing to talk about because, as you said, it's an issue that a lot of projects have at the moment. And I'd say since the tokens on Avalanche are multi-chain native. I mean, they they are the ones that minted these tokens. We do not have controls over them. And therefore, if the multi-chain issue does not get fixed, if we're not able to get all these tokens back to Ethereum, which is where BSGG is native, then the only solution would be uh, for a token migration. Create a new token and then have people go from the old token to the new token. But that obviously also brings in some risk. I mean, in the architecture, how are you going to, do that and how are you going to make sure i mean if we just make an open bridge where people can uh take the avalanche token and then get the new token then if suddenly multi-chain get it gets hacked and they mint tokens and then put them through that new migration thing then mm -hmm. they will have the new token so that's all that stuff we obviously have to talk about we have to figure out and that's also why um we'll have to delay the whole revenue share program because first yeah. we'll need to figure out what do we do with our holders and the token. But as I've said in the Discord before as well, any tokens that you buy now and own, it doesn't matter which chain, they will be counted once we do the migration. So okay. people do not need to worry. We'll take care of people. And if whatever hack happens, then it's not that difficult to take a snapshot on who actually held the tokens and where the tokens that suddenly got minted came from. So okay. yeah, there's, there's no risk when it comes to that. Um, cool. So it's way less. It's not a doomsday scenario at all. It's just really about risk management and how are we going to do the switch kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. So we're not worried about that um, at the moment. Um, obviously, we we are um, annoyed and and uh, we right. see this as an obstacle, but not a far from impossible one. And it's something we're confident that we will find the uh, optimal solution to. Okay. You know, how, so then how do you guys plan to, like, what is what is the next step then? Oh, I did have a question. So, yeah, the staking, the staking is down right now. So if, even if you bought BSGG, there is nowhere to stake it. And is that have to do with this multi-chain thing or is that just something else completely? No, not at all. That was uh, already planned. The reason for it is that, when we launched the staking a year ago, we knew that it would take a long time to build the project and everything. And we kind of wanted to give our early community members and supporters an opportunity to get more BSGG tokens for the tokens they had. 
uh, mm -hmm. especially because we know things move fast in DeFi and people are going from project to project. So we wanted to uh, give them the opportunity to just take these tokens and then lock them up for one year, forget about them, and then come back. And the timing was almost perfect, actually, because by the time that the staking uh, finished, our version 2 was almost ready. Um, nice. But obviously, uh, since we're working on the new um, revenue share platform, um, we decided to discontinue the old staking because there was not much purpose uh, from it. And we wanted to create more initiative and uh, give other tokens than just BGG to people because that is a bit pointless, right? And it kind of resembles, in the end, a Ponzi scheme if all you're living off of is staking your token, like we saw with all the DAOs, uh, yeah. Olympus, Wonderland, all of that. And um, yeah, we made it quite clear that uh, <laughs> BSGG is, is not about that. So that was just small. And if you compare the APYs that we offer it compared to all these other ones, uh, ours look quite humble <laughs> in that yeah. aspect. Um, yeah, So so yeah. Unfortunately, staking version one is down, but we're um, we're excited uh, for the revenue share, uh, revenue share platform to get out. But obviously, we have to figure out the multi-chain issue first, and then we'll be able to deliver um, on the revenue share. Okay, and and with that revenue share, right, with um with regulations and whatnot, is there any concern there? Like, are you guys just it's just multi-chain? Then you guys are going to turn on the revenue share? Or do you have to work? with some sort of compliance regulation thing as well. Is that something you guys are considering? Oh, yes, of course. Of course, this is something that uh, we've also discussed on the whiteboard a lot of times because what you cannot do is the traditional method where you just stake a token and then you get USDT because then you're a security, right? So we're looking for ways that we can circumvent that to not get in trouble. And obviously, we'll get a lot of legal opinion on that as well. So we're well prepared when it comes to that. So we're not like headless chickens running around. Everything is thoroughly planned and, and, and uh, thought through. So is, is there just out of curiosity, and if you can't share, I totally get it. Because I, I, I was brainstorming this, just trying to think about this yesterday because um, someone in the Discord, it might have been Lurker, Henry mentioned that. And I'm like, I don't know how you could possibly do a revenue share. I mean, you can't really give credits because not everyone that holds the token is going to necessarily be a better. And I, I'm just kind of wondering, is there any, is there any strategies that you're able to share or ideas that you guys have or, or no? Unfortunately not because it could backfire in the event that we don't go with that plan. So I'll be more confident with just, um, getting it ready. And once it launched, we can have another call, uh, discussing, that bit and i'll be more than happy to share uh why that specific uh approach works better okay yeah that works for me so i guess just lastly like so what what's next for bet swap so obviously what's uh our main priority right now is making sure that the pl platform is stable that people are happy uh, with the way it works and at the same time working on the multi-chain issue and third of all or lastly, marketing, of course, because we need people to uh, get familiar with BetSwap, BetSwap, come to our platform and bet. And this is all something that is in the works. Um, but uh, as you might understand, the team is working really hard and getting a bit, uh, I don't know, tired at the moment. So we'll just, I mean, take a couple of days and think about the V2 beta launch finding improvements for that and then we'll be ready to come back and and yeah uh, lay out a plan for the future okay sounds good where's the best place for people to go learn more about betswap if they wanted to uh, or discord server <laughs> discord. Cool. And, uh, yeah discord the gg uh, slash betswap gg um cool. because we'll have uh, we have our moderators here 24 7 ready to answer any questions and yeah as you've also noticed they are very helpful and always very friendly and nice to interact with. So, um, so yeah, I'll definitely recommend people to come and have a chat with them. Okay. And are you on Twitter? Do you want people to follow you on Twitter or anything? Uh, no need to follow me on Twitter, um, but uh, I'll be more uh, happy if they follow us on Discord. But you can follow BetSwap on Twitter. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Well, that's all I had. Kingmaker, I appreciate you coming on and answering the questions. Yeah, always a pleasure with you, Carl. It was, uh, it was real nice. And um, I'm looking forward to see you next time.